continue uh, in uh, going through Romans, Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, uh, turn to 14 to 15. Um, Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's true. And how, Now that's the objection, by the way. Uh, we'll just keep going. And, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel and bring good tidings. Of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went out into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. And I'll open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for another day of grace. We thank thee for the opportunity to gather freely around your word to learn. We know that 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 privilege that we have might not always be as free as it is now. We pray that, um, that, that we'd be allowed to do that in, in, the, in the days and years and, uh, to come. Uh, but we also want to remember that we need to take this opportunity to really cherish this wonderful privilege to gather around your word in freedom and freedom of thought. In Jesus' name, amen. So, verse 18 says, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Israel knew and was without excuse. They knew the gospel. They knew that Messiah had come. They had seen. We saw how uh, last week where the Pharisees watched Jesus come out of the water, they watched the heavens open, they, the people saw God and heard God saying, this is my son whom I'm, not, I'm well pleased. How do you not get this? You've got to understand what happened with the religious thinking and, 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 and rulership of Israel at the time. It is no different than the rulership that we are under today. Nothing has changed, okay? But man, if you see a guy come out of the water, some dude says, here's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, and he comes out of the water, and the heavens open, and goes, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. You've got to think, you know what? This is not an everyday occurrence. I didn't see this yesterday, right? But these guys still didn't get it. In Acts chapter, chapter 2, uh, in Acts chapter 1 and 2 for that matter, Jesus comes back after his death for 40 days and he shows himself and the word goes out. In Acts chapter 2, you have people from all over the world. Remember that? you got to remember... When Matthew says to go into all the world and teach all the nations Judaism, he was talking about the Jewish believers that were scattered throughout the earth. And you can see that in Acts chapter 2, the beginning of Acts chapter 2. It names all the nations. It never says the Gentiles. It says the nations which were Jews. This follows Christ's commandment of saying, go not but to the house of Israel. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Remember that? I know some people don't seem to get that concept. Listen. Words mean something. Okay? They mean something. And if you're going to ignore the words on the page, then you're just making up. You're doing exactly what the Pharisees and Jesus uh, chastised the Pharisees for. What you're doing is you're, saying you're using human viewpoint. 
Okay, you use a traditional viewpoint. We see organized churches today and, and organized Christianity. It's all about the traditional view, isn't it? We look at the Bible from a traditional point of view. We don't take it at its word because you can't take God at his word. That is the greatest warning throughout all of scripture is to take God at his word literally and perfectly. Get out of your viewpoint, get out of the religious viewpoint, get out of what you think and you feel. Most people approach the scriptures not by what they're reading, but what they feel. Okay? You understand, when you approach life by what you feel, you're an idolater. Did you get that? Do you understand that? Who are you worshiping? Me. You may as well put a little statue yourself up on the wall and go, hey, look at me. Right? That's exactly what you do. God didn't give you a brain so it can just sit there and get a bunch of information, be entertained. You don't approach the scriptures by your feelings. You don't approach them by tradition. Just because someone told me that's the way it should be, I'm going to look at it and I'm going to see what it actually says. I had a, a, a very dear friend of mine said, well, you know what? What's being said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and in versus Paul is not two different gospels. It's two different realities. Listen. One says one thing and the other says the exact opposite. They can't be two different. You can, you can cover them up with all kinds of words you want. They're different. Words mean something. And what happened with the Pharisees is they weren't going by the word of God. The people weren't going by the word of God. Remember Jesus, Jesus uh, said to them that Man shall not live by bread alone. What by what? Everybody know that verse? Sit aside. Say it out loud. Every word that, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What's he saying? Don't trust your feelings. Don't trust your eyes. Don't trust. It's not about what you see. It's about what God Almighty has wrote down on a page. Because what? He is absolutely 100% correct. And you're not. All right? So when we approach the scripture and we study it, what do we do? Pastor said it, so therefore we should, you know, do what pastor says. You know how many people think that way? Perhaps a bunch of you thought that way in the past. Well, pastor said it, got to be true. Right? Another form of idolatry. Right? It's the man. Listen, any one of you, if you had the minds to and you wanted to, could come up here and teach. If you had enough training, you could do that. All right? It's, it's not, it doesn't take a special skill and, and all kinds of, uh, of, of uh, uh, seminary and years. Of, obviously, study is, is required. I get that. But it doesn't take a special human being. Any human being can do it. And, 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 and when, you, when you read the Bible, you can understand it the same as me. Why? It's in English. So it's not hard. Now, if we all went to this by our feelings or by tradition, and tradition is based on feelings. Tradition is, well, you know, we've done it this way the whole time. Makes me feel good. So this is the way we should do things. And the Pharisees had a whole bunch of traditions. And you take modern churches today, everything is about tradition. We don't want to take the scripture for what it says. We want to look at it traditionally. We want to look, well, who created the tradition to begin with? Well, the religious snakes created the, the, the tradition. Right? Consider who the speaker is when you're considering what's being spoken. Right? Anyway, I got off on a tangent now. Israel was without excuse. Verse 14, 1014. 
Whom shall they call on? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? There is, this is the objection that Paul is his fielding. He, this is going to be the objection that Israel is going to give, and they're going to say, "Listen, you know what? We didn't enter into into righteousness. We didn't enter into the kingdom because no one told us about it." And he's going, how shall they hear without it? That's what the people are saying. How am I going to know if no one taught me? Right? Well, it doesn't matter if you're walking around life like this and going, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> right? If you go, well, it's, it's just a different reality. I'm not going to trust the word of God. I'm going to trust my pastor, my priest, my rabbi. Because they're trustworthy people. People don't even think like that. I mean, I, <laughs> the largest, one of the largest churches in Christendom, I won't say too much more because you get in trouble, are known for one thing rampant pedophilia. And yet people flock by the billions. Why? The Holy Father. It is that type of thinking, that lack of critical thinking, that lack of, of looking for truth and just depending on the human being. That's idolatry. That's what it is. It makes me feel good because I can go and I can do a ritual and I can, you know, go and confess my sins to the holy priest and he's going to make me holy, right? I can make signs and I can pray over and over, our Father, our heaven, help me, oh, mother full of grace. Yeah, I can go all through that stuff and what does it do? It makes me feel good. That's why I do it. <laughs> Yet the Bible says don't do that. Oh, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to believe that. I want to believe the church. I don't know how many people know this. Probably everybody in this room. But how many people know, maybe not on the internet, that the Bible strictly forbids to call a man your father. It says you do not call a man your father. And that goes back to Baalism, okay? That goes back to when you wanted a priest, you called him your spiritual father. Okay, that's what that was all about. But anyway, call no man father, yet the entire Catholic Church and probably most, most Coptic churches say father about the priest. What are they doing? They're idolizing him. Whatever you say, father, I will do. Oh, father. That sounds like, like good that cartoon. Oh, Father. Suffer and suck it has. <laughs> okay. Anyway. The objection was, how should they believe? You didn't tell me. How am I supposed? You can't hold me responsible, they're going to say. You didn't even tell me. And he goes, oh, 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 wait a second, dude. You knew. People look at the beauty, the magnificence of creation. And they say, there is no God. But they feel it. They feel it, oh, it's so beautiful. And the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Do you know why the Bible says that? Because the Bible knows that that guy is a hypocritical liar. He has an agenda to serve his feelings. And his feelings are more important than God's word. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't have any feelings. Everybody's got emotions. We're not saying, oh, walk around like Mr. Spock. That's not what we're saying. But what I'm saying is, when my feelings override the scripture, and I go, well, I can't believe the scripture because I feel, and I've gone through this event, and I've seen this, and my pet. When you start doing that, you're going by your own feelings and your own thoughts and, a, and agenda, and guess what? You know, the Bible says that, your heart is wicked above all things. Who, who should know it? The heart. And that's where your feelings come from, right? 
It has an agenda. Sin in your flesh has an agenda. We went through the heart thing last year, I think last year, and it was fascinating uh, what all the heart is responsible for. It, it's crazy. So how can we believe if no one told us? Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You notice that there. You, a lot of the people use verse 9 and 10 to preach salvation today. And understand that those are not good verses to preach salvation today. All right? But many times they'll say, there's even a song, you know, Romans 9 and 10 is, 10 and 9 is a favorite verse of mine. Anyway, th this, those are not good verses. If you're going to use verses, look at Verse 13, which says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call upon the name of the Lord, guess what? You may not know all the doctrine. You've got to understand that. You may not know all the doctrine, but you call upon the name of the Lord, what's going to happen? He's going to answer. All right? The word has gone out even in its simplest form. Even in creation, it says... They know me, they're without, chapter 1, Romans, remember that? They're without excuse. They know me, they know I'm God. It's not about you knowing a particular thing that's important. Obviously, the information is important. But when you call out upon the name of the Lord, he's not going to say, well, you know what? You didn't call me by the right name. <laughs> yeah, going to hell. You understand that, right? You get that, that that's not, that... The heart, whosoever calls upon it, says verse 13 is a much better verse than, than 9 and 10 would be. Now that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of teaching the gospel, does it? No. Why? How beautiful are the feet of those, right? Everyone here in this room has the ability to be a preacher. Doesn't mean you have to stand up at a podium. You go out, you talk to people, and I know a lot of you do. And you share that gospel. Why? That's why you're here. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd have taken you home and said, okay, it's all done, you're out of here. Right? Imagine that. You hear the gospel, you're gone. Well, then there's really nobody to tell you about it, <laughs> I suppose. But you know what I'm saying? All right, verse 15, okay? I'm preaching now. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed, all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing what? Human viewpoint? Traditionalism? Your and my feelings? About a particular subject? No. You understand that as soon as I start to reinterpret the scripture and say, well, those words don't actually mean that. What's happening? What am I doing? That's my viewpoint. That's my opinion. But notice what that verse says. Faith comes by hearing what? Paul's opinion? The word of God. If my opinion doesn't agree 100% with the Word of God, what is it? Wrong. Useless. Got it? When our opinions don't agree 100% with the Word of God, it's a useless opinion. It leads to destruction of, of the person hearing it. That's all that happens. Right? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You know, I prayed this morning. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. There are very, very evil people that have agendas to take away your ability to even study that. They're starting it off by economy and control and all that kind of stuff. But believe me, don't, 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 don't get this... Don't lose the agenda, Satan's agenda is always to make sure you don't have that book and you can't study it. Take this opportunity, don't lose it. Redeem the time because the days are evil. 
okay? And we know their evil days. And there's going to come a time where you're going to be looked at as some sort of psychotic heretic because you ever believed in that Bible, and you're going to serve, and they'll take that Bible away. That's that's the type. That's the end game of all of this silliness that's going on right now. Don't be fooled by that. All right. Now you can you can spend your whole time trying to change the system. Good luck with that. Ain't going to happen. All right. Verse says, study that, that, that we should study to be quiet and mind our own business. We pray for the leaders that they allow us, okay? That they allow us to, to, to I mean, talk and study God's word and so on. There'll come a point where you won't have that book, perhaps, and you won't be able to study it. And right now you can take it for granted because it's there. You know, there's, learn this stuff, even if you don't have the book. I remember as a young man, um, growing up, my dad, we used to, we used to memorize verses. And we used to have these, these cute little stickers that I used to put in my Bible. I don't know if, how many of you had that. Um, but in the gospel hall where, when I was young, We'd have to memorize a verse every week, and and, and the show-offs would memorize more than that, you know. <laughs> but but they'd be these little stickers, and they were kind of little color pictures of the Bible to deal with a verse on it. And you would put it in your Bible, and you'd have to memorize that for Sunday school next next Sunday, right? And and we were all kind of proud because because the next Sunday went. But if you got one word wrong, and that's it, you're out of here, right? Strike three. You'd have to do it again. And it's like, <sighs> but. We would memorize those verses, and I thought, okay, I'm, you know, it's fun, and so on and so forth as a kid. But when I got into the military, when I was 16, I got into the military, there was nobody talking about the Bible. But there was a lot of sin coming my way, and a lot of temptation. And do you know what used to come to my mind every time something happened? It was those little verses that I memorized. Parents, if you have a child, get a verse in their thinking. Make, let them memorize it. Well, they say, well, they don't have good memories. So what? Practice makes perfect. Just like playing basketball, you're not good the first time, you gotta practice. Just because there'll come a day when you're not gonna be able to do that. You're not gonna be able to take your phone and look it up. And that's why I so discourage and I really dislike, I'll say it straight out loud, people who come and they're gonna do a Bible study and they bring out their phone. What a useless endeavor. You can't write it down. You can't make notes. It, it, I'm not saying you have a Bible and your phone in case you want to look things up quickly. I get it. It's quicker than the concordance and stuff like that. Okay, I get that. But what happens is you have a dependency on the phone to give you your information and you don't remember it. And that's a big thing. I know because I went through the same thing. Man, I used to remember that. But I'm so used to looking it up on my phone, I just, I would forget Put that away, right? Get the verse in your head because those verses, when you're going through troubles, and we all look at society right now and the times that we're in, we're going, troubles are coming, right? You think this is troubles now? Oh, no, you just hang on for the ride, okay? You got to get worse before it gets better. And those verses and that word, that faith, you understand, when we talk about faith, and I'm just, I think most of you here understand, but just in case you don't, and people watch and don't, when we talk about living by faith, we don't talk about going, oh, well, the Lord will take care of it. I don't have to worry about it. That's not what he's saying. That's not what that's talking about at all, okay? And I, I live by faith. I don't have to go to work. The Lord's going to take care of it. Good luck with that, right? That's not what he's talking about. He says, faith cometh by hearing what? Think about that for a second. My faith comes by hearing the word of God. Why? The word of God becomes my faith. You see? Inverted. The word of God produces my faith. And the only way I can get that faith is by listening and studying the word of God. Okay? That's what that means. 
It has nothing to do with blind faith. It has nothing to do with any of that. Or I just got a feeling and my faith is going to... That's not what it's like. That's not what's going on in the scripture here. All right? So anyway, Isaiah 52. Because in verse 16, go to Isaiah 52. In verse 15... Um, It's a quote from Isaiah 52, 7. So if you go to Isaiah 52, verse 7, you'll see it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, and that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Right? Israel knew! Their God had come to earth. He had performed miracles. He had raised the dead. He had given them everything. And who was reigning? Their God. And what did they reject? Their God. Except for the little remnant. Right? The little flock. Romans chapter 10. Back, back to verse 18 now. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. By a foolish nation will I anger you. Deuteronomy 32. By a foolish nation will I anger you. This is often misquoted to say that it's the Gentiles that are being spoken about. Nada. It is not the Gentiles. The Gentiles are not in view as, and notice that it said by a foolish nation, not nations. What does Gentiles mean? The nations. By a foolish nation will I provoke you to jealousy. Okay? He's talking about a particular nation. Which one? Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. And verse... Uh, I got it right there, but anyway. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. 32, 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. What's he talking about? He's talking about their own feelings, their own traditions, their own human viewpoint, their uselessness. They have provoked me to jealousy, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. What is a foolish nation? What is that foolish nation? That foolish nation, folks, is the little remnant which is going to be promised, and we'll go through the verses there, that, that, is, going to be, that is being promised this nation out here, just a few little people. How foolish is that? You're going, wait a second. We have an established religious order. We have a governance. We have this great nation here. And you're going to take these rabble rousers and you're going to see that why I use the term rabble rousers. Because the people that Christ chose are the silliest bunch when you start to look at it from a nation building process. He's choosing the rednecks. Okay? He's choosing those guys that, that are, even Nathaniel said that they came out of Galilee, and he said, can any good come out of Galilee? You're talking about northern Israel there. Can any good come out of there? They had been cast aside years before. We're talking about Judah here. Why isn't Judah the, the nation? Why are you taking these guys who, there's nothing good that comes out of those guys. And he's going to take that little, that little uh, uh, remnant and he's going to create a nation out of them. And they said, that's foolish. Okay? And he's going to provoke the nation to jealousy. 
He's not doing that. He's not even talking about, about uh, the Gentiles at this point. He's referring back to Deuteronomy 32 where he says, this is, a, this is a foolish nation. He's not talking about the nations. Words mean something, right? If you say, well, that's the Gentiles, then you're saying, you, you're, you just take that word Gentiles and understand what that word means. It means the nations, okay? If you're going to say Gentiles, take it out and say the nations. By a foolish nations? No. By a foolish nation. It's one. So then you say, well, which one is it then? Well, we're going to see. All right? The 12 were sent. The 12 disciples were sent. And they preached to all these people. And that word went out through all the world. And those people knew that it was the truth because Moses had told them about it already. And they had the Torah. They had the prophecies. They knew. All they had to do was check on it. Okay? The same will be for you. If you say, well, Lord, I didn't know. Well, wait a second. Didn't you have your Bible? We have a pastor didn't tell him. I didn't talk about it. I never did. Wait a second. Your faith doesn't come by pastor. That doesn't say that. Your faith doesn't come by TV. Your faith doesn't come by your feelings. If your faith comes by your feelings, you're in deep trouble. Okay? Because your feelings go up and down like a yo-yo. If I'm trusting in God because I feel good, what do I need to do? I need to join these guys next door. <coughs> Why? Because I need the Amway treatment. I gotta get motivated. <laughs> right? I gotta get motivated. Hands up in the air. Right? Now you know, listen, if you want to believe in that, go ahead. Alright? More power to you, fill your boots. But if you sat and thought for two seconds, you would know that that's not an eternal program. That is not something that's going to get you through hard times, is it? Because I tell you what, if I can't get to my Amway meeting and get motivated and hands up in the air, and if I can't do that, I won't be able to do that when I'm sitting in a prison somewhere, lingering in a prison. It won't work. Your faith doesn't come by your feelings. It comes by hearing the word of God and having that word work in you and become part of your thinking so that you can look at the situation and go, that's not reality. The reality is that I won already through Jesus Christ my Lord. He already, you are complete in him as above all principality and power. You're complete in him. What's the worst thing that can happen to you as a believer? Right? What's the best thing that can happen to you as a believer? You can die. Worst thing that can happen to you as a human is you can die. Wow. You got that. You won. That's it. You win. All right, let's all go home. Luke 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 47. Luke 11, verse 47. I want to read you something. And see what happened to the nation Israel. The accusation goes out and, and several times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to Israel about what they had done. Verse 47, 47 to 51. Woe unto you, for ye built sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. <laughs> you see the hypocrisy? You see the hypocrisy? He says, woe unto you. You build these big mausoleums for the prophets, and these places they can go visit, you know, like, like, like Arlington Cemetery, or the, the, the tomb of the unknown. So you build this, but you killed them. Your fathers killed them. We do the same thing. We got the tomb of the unknown soldier. Who killed them? Well, the governments of the past. Why? 
They want to start a war and make money. All right? And it's all hidden under, you know, you got to fight evil. <laughs> right? And he says to them, he says, you built the sepulchers for the prophets and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers for in, they indeed killed them and ye build their sepulchers. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they shall slay and persecute. But the blood of all of the prophets which is shed from the foundation of the world may be required from this generation. At, from the blood of who? Abel. I was going a long way back. Unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. He said, you guys knew and you killed them. You knew they were prophets. You didn't like what they said and you killed them. So you can't say now, I didn't know. No one told me. Why didn't you send a preacher to let me know? You all knew. You don't, you don't think that back in that time that that didn't go through all of Israel and get carried on to every other Jew throughout, throughout the world? They knew. I guarantee you they knew. Not only they knew, but the Gentiles even knew. The Gentiles knew they were killing their prophets. Look at Pilate, how he dealt with Christ. And said, the man, I find nothing wrong. I, he's done nothing wrong. But you still want to kill him. He's thinking, what's wrong with you people? You see? They kill them all, and then they build fancy graves for them to cover it up. You see? The momentum of sin had grown so high that due time had come. You know what I mean by that? Due time? Sin had grown so much that that was the last to be tolerated. It was done. You know? You ever heard parents say to you, say to you go, I've had enough. This is it. You have been doing this over and over. I'm done. That's called due time. That comes before what? The spanking. Okay? That's what happens. Okay? I have had it with you. I up to here. It's due time. Okay? So due time had come because their sin had been built up so much that the blood of the prophets was being required. They knew that. You know how they knew that? Because their scriptures had told them. That that's what they would do. And all they had to do was look back and they just saw. And guess what they were going? Wrath. Remember what John the Baptist said to the Pharisees? Oh, you vipers. You snakes. Who's warned you from the wrath to come? He's going, you're the guys the wrath's going to come up on. And all of Israel was given that when John the Baptist came, he said, repent of what? Their ways. They had turned against their God. Repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. If the kingdom of God is at hand, what's coming first? Wrath. The wrath on those who do not what? Repent. Right? And you know what repent is, right? How many people think repentance is going down and he's going, oh, Lord, please forgive me? How many people think that? That's not what repentance means. But I think most of you probably thought that throughout your life. Why? Because religion told you that. Mm -hmm. Right? Religion told you that you need to, I need to see sorrow in your eyes when you come down that aisle. Come to the altar. They got an altar, you know. You got an altar. They took that from Judaism. Okay? The altar is where you put the sacrifice on. You got to come, you got to sacrifice. You see how they're doing that? Are you a Jew? No. You're not. Christ is, is the ultimate sacrifice. He's paid all the price. Why are you re sacrificing? Why? Because it makes you feel good and it makes everybody else feel good about you so you can all be a bunch of idolaters and feel great. You see? See how that works? 
and I gotta get a guy to come down. I gotta repent. You see the guys down there? You ever see those guys in the streets? Repent, you're going to hell. You see those guys? They're talking about this, and they don't even know what they're talking about. Repent means to change your mind. And what happened was the nation of Israel had been following a, a, a corrupt religious system based on their own viewpoint, their own feelings, the, fe the, the, the things being taught by, by, the, the, uh, by the religious hierarchy at that point. Okay? And he said, you're all wrong. That system's not holy. And you get the idea here that the people instinctively knew they were following something that was wrong. You notice that? Because they came down and they said, yeah, you're right. This is all a big scam. This is all sham. There's nothing righteous about this. How many people fall for the same issue in today's church? How many people go to church and they listen to people and they listen to the church and they go, you know what? This is all done. Why? It's nothing but legalism is what it is. Meant to make you conform. Meant to control you through fear mongering. That's what it's meant to do. And that's what happened there. They knew their religious system was, a, was baloney, just like people do today when they start talking about these biggest, big religious organizations. And they go, but I still believe in it. But man, I know it's so. Uh... You see, the nation had fallen into that. The generation, the thinking process, the, the generation of that day has not changed even today. And it won't change out here. But what's going to happen here is that he is going to require at that point the blood from those unrighteous people. Alright? Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Verse 34. Matthew 23, verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you the prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth and the blood of righteous Abel to, unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachus, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Mm, pretty stiff words. Rask. And you unholy, unrighteous bunch of scoundrels are going to be the ones that I pour the wrath out on. That's the message that he says, because he said, you guys killed them. Remember what they said to Christ? They said, crucify him. And they took what over Christ? A murderer. And they said, crucify him. And Pilate said, the guy's done nothing wrong. What's wrong with you people? Crucify him. And then they said, let his blood, remember that one? Let his blood be upon us and our children. Isn't that wild? They were just repeating what Christ was teaching in Matthew here. He's going, yep, and you identified yourself as the ones that I'm going to pour my wrath of and demand the blood of the prophets from. Wrath. The issue of the kingdom, you notice here it says from Abel. The issue of the kingdom is from Abel, not Abraham. It goes all the way back to Abel. Think about that. Because Abel was to go into, was to live in a perfect nation. Remember, he goes back to Adam and he says, I'll send a redeemer. I'm going to re, I'm going to fix all of this. Adam, you messed it up. But I'm going to fix it. 
And I'm going to fix it through your son or your seed. Abel comes. Where do, what's, what's his brother do? Kills him. Abel's a prophet. From Abel to Zacharias, from, generate, from Genesis to Revelation, the whole of the Jewish Bible, from Genesis to Second Chronicle, the blood of the prophets is upon them because he says, you're just like them. Justice is going to be meted out. God is not an unjust God. Every wrong that ever is going to be done He's going to make it right. Okay? And thank the Lord Jesus that he's not held you and your sin against you like he's going to hold against these rascals. Woo you don't want to be here. Thank God you're, that you're saved in the day of grace and you're washed by the blood of Christ because I'm telling you, you don't want to be here. And if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, if you haven't said, I believe that Christ has died on the cross and was buried and rose again from my sin, then when this escape hatch opens, you ain't going up in it. And you're going to go straight on to this. And you don't want to be there. You understand that God, when, when Christ paid for your sin, when he redeemed you, he redeemed you so that you would not be required the wrath to be poured out here. But if you want to be like those that say, I don't care. You see? Wrath. You die in that sin here, eternal wrath. You live through this, you're probably going to die here anyway. Probably one of the most gruesome deaths you ever thought about fear. Forget about fear of going on today. Oh. Okay? But if you happen to make it through, even. <clears throat> Verse 31. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we're in Matthew 23, verse, 20, uh, verse 36. Did I just read that? Yep, I did. They killed all the prophets. It's going to be required of them. And he said, and you guys are going to finish what your father started. He told them in Israel. You've got to understand that Christ in his earthly ministry here, what he's doing is he's preparing the nation to get, go into this to go into here, okay? So when you hear, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand, they understood what was going on between that and that. They got that. He's preparing them and he's saying, listen, you guys better change your ways. Repent, change your mind, change your ways because I am going to pour this out and I'm going to require the blood of the prophets, the things that your father did, you're going to be responsible for too because you're just like them. Right? Luke chapter 1. Verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now that horn of salvation is who? Christ. Okay? A horn is a ruler. Okay? And he spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, as he spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Does that strike a bell to you? Since the world began, they've been talking about this. Remember in Acts chapter 3, where he says, this is going on and this has been spoken by the mouth of the prophets since the world began? Hmm? He's talking about this. Remember Paul said that the revelation of the mystery, the gospel, the grace of God was what? Kept secret since the world began? 
not the same thing, is it? It's pretty obvious. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. You notice that he said the point of prophecy was to take the righteous seeds out of Israel and bring them into a land where they could serve God for eternity. That's the point of the kingdom. And what he's going to have to do is he's going to have to sift out the evil, wicked, and often the wicked were the guys who were supposed to be the righteous leaders. He's going to have to sift them out. He's going to, he's going to pour his wrath out. He's going to kill them. He's going to put them here. And then this righteous nation is going to come in. That's the point of prophecy. Okay? That's the whole point of Israel. That's what the whole game is about. All right? Acts 2.29. Acts 2.29. I'm going to see something here. Acts 2.29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing what, that God has sworn with an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that is, his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh to see corruption. Thus Jesus hath God, this Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witness. All of us are witness. You know when they crucified Christ on that cross, you think that all of Israel didn't hear about it? Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens. There was an idea that David was going to be the king and the ruler. He was going to come back. He was going to be this ruler here. Okay? There was that idea. He said, no, 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 it's not about David. It's about Christ. Okay? For David, verse 34, is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith to himself, The Lord hath said unto my Lord, Sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel, notice that, all of the house of Israel, not all of the world, not all of the nations, all of the house of Israel, assuredly, know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He says, you killed him. God raised him up. He's sitting in heaven. The Holy Spirit has come down, right? This is what's going on in early Acts. You killed him. God raised him up. The Holy Spirit came down, right? God is reigning. He's coming back. You better repent and be baptized. We know baptism was for uh, what reason? The kingdom. No, but what was the reason that you were baptized? Become a priest. To become a priest. You had, as a priest, to go out and do your job, you had to be baptized. So, so the nation is a nation of... And I'm going to have to wrap it up here. So Acts 2.39. Uh, For the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So you have a nation, they understand the corruptness they're living in, they understand their religious leaders are corrupt, they understand all that stuff, they know that they have to repent. They knew that. They just had, 
you, can you imagine that you've got your synagogues and your and your rabbis and everything, and you can't even go to them, and they're they're so unrighteous, and you know it, right? So how how horrible is that? We're going to wrap this up. So, that salvation that we're talking about there is different than Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, isn't it? What is the salvation there? What's the salvation they're looking for there? Physical salvation. They're looking at the salvation from their enemies. They're looking at the salvation of going through this and going, man, they're all going to come against us. And they're going, we need to get into the kingdom. That is a totally different ideology that's going on there. And if you compare that to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, what do you got? Totally different. Okay. If you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that's Ephesians, that's that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, right? That He's redeemed you, that He's paid for your sins. That's not what they're looking for. What they're looking for is to repent and be baptized and operate as a righteous nation in this kingdom. And if you see here in Revelation, you'll see over and over, he'll say, if you overcome to the end. Now think about that overcoming. Think about that overcoming. So there's a work ethic there. You see? If you don't overcome, what happens? You ain't getting in. Sorry. You gotta overcome. And and remember the Lord's Prayer? Remember that? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, what? Our daily bread. Why? Why they give us the day our daily bread? That's not prayer for today here. You can pray that all day long. Man, it ain't going to fall on your table for supper. It ain't going to happen. Your daily bread isn't going to come by miraculous means. Okay? It's because back here they won't be able to buy, sell, or even work. They're going to be starving. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us. How? As we forgive those who trespass against us, forgive our trespasses as we. So the, the overcoming there is that they are going to be forgiven in the same way they forgive someone who want, tries to kill them. Hmm, that's a tough one. When their enemies are going, to, are going to go against them, what are they going to say? Turn the other cheek. If their enemies go and kill them, what are they going to say? I forgive you. Remember Stephen? He's being stoned. What does he say? Stephen's got this. What's he say? He says, Lord, hold this not to their account. You see how the little flock was to operate? That righteous nation has to operate, and it has to have that attitude to get into here. If it doesn't have that attitude, what it's going to be? An enemy of God versus friend of God. See? If that salvation is from the wrath that's going to be poured out, not the wrath that's going to be poured out on earth here, but if you, you're going to be saved out of this, resurrected to this kingdom, or you're going to go to hell. Okay? All right, so that's, uh, we're going to end that off there. So then we'll take a look at times and seasons next week. Uh, I don't have my pencil. But we'll end it there, okay? So, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Your Word. We thank Thee for the ability to search it and, and to grow and to, to understand uh, what's happened, what's happening, and what's going to happen. And we know that You have conquered all. And we are to trust Your Word in our everyday life um, and not put it aside. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Is there a pencil?